Right, good morning. Can everyone hear me clearly? How's that? I don't need to stand here because we're not going to be that typical academic pew discussion group here. But so thanks for coming. I'm sure hopefully others will filter in. If not, it is a Sunday, you know, and it is the third day and, you know, everyone's slowly, slowly getting tired. And uh, we all understand that. But I think this little session was conceived because it's a topic that's probably not talked enough about. It's what everyone wants, but it's not talked enough about, and that's universal health coverage. And we've got a really cool group of people who are going to support this panel, uh, this whole discussion together. And we'll start off with some introductions first. So my name's Kunal Patel. I work for a group called IHEED. I'm also a physician. I work in travel and tropical med. And travel and tropical medicine is very interesting because you end up working a lot in low resource settings. And that's where you see the need for universal health coverage the most. But bizarrely, when you come home, you find actually you need it next door as well. So it's not, it's not a developing country. And that phrase developing, we shouldn't really be using anymore. It's a worldwide problem. And what we do at IHEED is we focus on the solutions to help support that via primary care training and primary care education. And the reason why that is important is because nearly all our health services are delivered at the primary care level, and they should be, rather than secondary care or specialist care. So that's a little bit about me. What I'm going to do is just ask the panelists to introduce themselves so you're familiar with who they are and what they do. So this is Bill Simpson. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Simpson. I'm um, data science director for a company called Memotext, and we basically uh, use health data to try and um, use technology to help people uh, get better and reach their healthcare goals. I, I don't come from a background of technology. Um, I actually am a neuroscientist by training, um, studied circadian rhythms and postpartum depression, uh, but now I'm an algorithm data science kind of guy. Um, Kunal asked me to be here to be the sort of voice of reason when it comes to data and what the potential is. Um, I'll pass it on to Caitlin. Okay. Uh, so my name is Caitlin, um, and I'm an AP patient. And so in, uh, in October of 2016, I was diagnosed with endometriosis, which is a chronic uh, painful condition of the pelvic, um, and there's no cure. And so I was diagnosed in France. Um, and what, what struck me, because I studied international politics and human rights um, in my undergrad, and what struck me when I was diagnosed was that there was no education on what's normal in a woman's body and so from 14 until 22, I didn't know what was normal. Um, and so I thought that that was just a grave human rights abuse um, that was happening here in the US. Um, and that it took until France um, that doctors actually asked me about, about things that here in the US are just kind of pushed aside. So. Hi, I'm Kelly McKee. I work at Eli Lilly and Company in the Clinical Innovation Group. And it's my job and my team's job to find game-changing solutions and how we can improve clinical trial awareness, participant um, participation, um, et cetera. And I think that um, talking about having clinical research as a care option is one way that we can really expand the notion of improving um, health coverage. Well, great. Does this work, by the way, as well? So we've got two mics, excellent. You guys can share that there. So just to put it into context before we open this out between the panelists and between, between yourselves, because I think this is a subject that is something that should be discussed rather than told from one direction to the other. And who here actually knows what universal health coverage means? Raise your hand. Well, let's find out. So how many, raise them high. I don't see many. Okay, fine. Okay, do you know the difference between that and universal health access? Or is that what you're thinking about? So what are you thinking about? Universal health access or universal health coverage? Which is it? Okay, so there you go. You see, it's already confusing, right? Universal health coverage by international definition is the provision for preventative, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative services to anyone and everyone without placing a financial burden on them, okay? And it's 
actually covered by three dimensions. You know, what are the services? Who's covered? And what are the proportions of the costs? And this is WHO standard. This has been signed by every country that forms part of the United Nations as part of the Sustainable Development Goals 3.8. And everyone's familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? So which means your country is obliged, wherever you're from, to actually try to achieve universal health coverage. But what's interesting and what makes this, I think, the panel different is that we're talking about how can innovation support it? Because I mentioned those three dimensions, but the dimensions that we're not often discussing enough about are education, where I come from, data, clinical research, and more importantly, the patient. Okay, so you have a lot of policymakers who talk about the costs and the proportions, of it, but they're not talking about that enough. And if anything, they have to drive that. So from an education point of view, I used to bandy a figure around about how short health workers we have worldwide. It's actually now predicted to be 40 million by 2030. And we're, getting, we're short, we need 18 million of that 40 million in low resource settings. So we need a huge amount of health workers to be trained up and to be educated for universal health coverage to achieve it at the primary care level. There's no radical solution. There's no one buck fits all. But I think what's interesting is that if I show you some figures here, just to throw it into context, we want everyone to think about, well, how can we incorporate data? How can clinical research help achieve this? And how can we get the patient voice to be stronger? So look, you can see 100 million people are pushed into poverty every year due to health care costs. 90% of the population of low-income countries have no health care coverage. And 20 to 40% of all health spending is wasted due to inefficiencies. So think about that as well. And of course, it makes sense that data's got to help drive this forward. Clinical research has to drive it forward. And as I said, the patient voice has to put it forward. So bring it back to the panel first. I mean, I'll probably, and again, we're just it's a general question, but Caden, do you think, honestly, from your perspective, is universal health coverage achievable? Yes, I do. I do think it's achievable. And I think that it should be a goal that everybody strives towards um, from a governance perspective. But we exist in a, in a money-making world. So when, when you get down to what matters to the patient, sometimes it's not always, it's not always going to make money. And it's, it's going to be something that that's just been pushed aside when you talk about more like lifestyle factors or things like that. Okay, no, absolutely. And I think, um, but then now we have your voice and we have Kelly and Bill's there. Do you think that data could support that, Bill? You know, how can, what, what do we need to do from the data perspective? And obviously every talk, everyone talks about big data, but what about the little and the moderate data? Like, you know, what can we do? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, there's been a lot of great conversation at this meeting in particular uh, about the amount of health data that's being generated and some of the practical applications um, for it. Um, I think a big thing for, from my perspective is, is we actually have to change the ownership structure of the data, I think, in order to support this goal. So at the moment, um, and it varies obviously by health system and country and, and what have you, but at the moment the, the control over the information that is required to advance this principle uh, sits in the hands of, of insurers, of hospital networks, of the software companies who own the tools that we use to collect and aggregate the information. Um, and by that nature, it's always going to be restricted in its use. It's almost like there's a there's a barrier that's put up there for uh, people who have interesting ideas about how to use it for a bigger purpose such as this. Um, they can't access it, the cost barrier is really high, or there's a, a legal or regulatory barrier that's in place um, that sort of restricts innovation in that sense. Um, and I think uh, a, a bigger goal would be to change the locus of ownership of that information such that um, you know, if you are, you know, you're the person who's generating that data, it's about you, and therefore you, you should have ultimate say over what happens to it and what you can do with it. And I think we're moving in that direction. I just saw yesterday that um, Epic is officially opening up its platform to allow patients to uh, have access to their data whenever they want it for whatever purpose that they want. Um, and I think, you know, 
if we build a regulatory framework to uh, protect patients and their data and, and say that, yes, this is your information, you, you can do what you want with it if you want to share it with innovators, if you want to do this or do that, um, then we enable uh, that data to actually um, help us reach this goal. Um, and, and it could be, you know, it could be through telemedicine, it could be through better diagnostics, like the, the tools that the actually get used are, are, are going to vary depending on the specific thing. But I think changing the, uh, changing the owner and putting the power of that information back in the hands of the patient is, is a big step from the data perspective. Yeah, that is interesting. So is it data though or is it communication? Because Caitlin, as I hear your story, I hear my doctors didn't ask me the right questions. And we're not allowed to talk about these things in our culture. So, you know, is it, it's probably a combination, right? But if we go back to education, our primary care physicians aren't even taught about clinical trials or taught about how to use this type of data or what questions to ask. And Kelly, you just touched on clinical trials there. Um, how does that data that Bill's talking about it's, we're talking right now, and a lot of people have at this event talked about personal data. But the data that we're missing is the scientific data that comes out of research, which is probably going to provide more quality in terms of healthcare and coverage. But how does clinical, the clinical research aspect, you know, form into this? How do, can it get supported by the data that Bill is talking about? I, I think in a few ways, right? So before the clinical trial happens, we can use data, if we have access to it, to identify potential participants, invite them to participate. Um, but it's really, really hard to get all those systems talking to one another with the different physicians who are involved and what you need. And so, you know, I think that we've been trying to band-aid the situation where we can, but also empower patients to take it upon themselves to learn more. And we need to improve both, right? So not only do we need to make clinical research part of our everyday medical talking points, but we also need to be able to use this kind of data to help identify the people that a clinical research would be most uh, appropriate for. Okay, and Caitlin, do you, having heard all that now, do you feel, think that fits? Do you think it can happen? Do you think it, it is, do you feel the onus is more on you? As Kelly said, is it split between both us as pa and remember, we're all actually patients at the end of the day. You're not the only one who is. And um, do you think it could be split? Do you think it could be broke even? Well, I want to go back to, to Kelly's point about education. And it's education on like my perspective that on, you know, a social level, I wasn't educated. Um, and it wasn't something that we talked about, um, women's health. But it's also from a physician perspective um, gynecological doctors, they're siloed. And so when it comes down to it, when I was looking for a surgeon um, to have an operation in March, I, I felt lost because when you're looking at endometriosis, you're, you're not just looking at one aspect of it. You need, to, you need to look at the whole pelvic cavity and all of the different organs that are affected in there. And what's tough is that gynecological surgeons, they only train, they don't train on general surgery. And so they're just siloed in. And from the, the cultural perspective too, with universal health coverage, is that my hope is that doctors and physicians and um, from the uh, educational perspective, people will start opening up about the topics that maybe in the US aren't socially acceptable to talk about, but in France they were. Because for the first time in France, I had a physician ask me, so tell me about your sex life. And it wasn't, it wasn't an invasive question, it wasn't odd, it was just like, is sex comfortable, is it not, does it hurt? And that was the first time that I actually had a physician ask me that question. And it shocked me and I didn't really know how to answer. And here in the US, when I first had symptoms, it was, oh, well, that's your period. Welcome to womanhood. And that's where, the, where it ended. Wow. So I mean, you've touched on a couple of things, which I want to bring back to you, Bill, which I think is quite interesting, is that you mentioned education. You mentioned the, the word, the S word, silos, right? And um, 
what we've seen from the education space, and it's something that we probably haven't talked enough about over the three days, is that we still hear this, the same two words, physician, patient, right? And it's no fault of your own or us that we do that because that's how we experience healthcare. But if you think about the silos within itself, is that it's not just the physician and the patient, it's the nurse, it's the community health worker, it's the midwife, so it's a bigger team. Yet, when we train them, we train them very separately. We don't train them interprofessionally, which is where the way we should be going. It should be interprofessional education at the primary care level. And we also try to do that via online. It doesn't have to be fancy. But then if it is going to be online, we're talking about patient data all the time, and we're talking about physician data all the time. Bill, what can we do to actually use innovative sources of data help bring in those other players in the healthcare system into this space, namely the nurses, the midwives, and the community health workers? Uh, it, it's an interesting question. I, I want to actually back up a bit because you've cued me on, on something else. So last year, um, I'm not sure if any of you uh, saw it, but Jonathan Bush, who's a CEO of a, of a big EMR company, he gave a talk about what technology can do generally. And he said there's there's sort of three pillars of technology. There's administrative automation, resource control, and, and building a network. And what you're touching on, and I think what we're touching on here is, is you know, there's aspects of education, and so we need to build the network around so that we can do it more interprofessionally and exchange the data and, and whatnot. But I, I also want to highlight that, you know, the, the pathway to better healthcare access and coverage for everybody we still have very many fundamental problems in those three domains within the system that are not being tackled at the moment. You know, people are still faxing referrals to each other. Physicians are still sending themselves handwritten notes. Um, you know, there's there's lots of inefficiency and poor, uh, I don't want to say poor practice because that's not what it is. but definitely suboptimal ways of communicating and ways of using the technology that is at our disposal, that if we focus on those larger, it's a, and the reason we don't focus on it is because it's a large, complicated pro problem. Like nobody wants to, nobody wants to go to work in the morning and say, I'm going to figure out how to make physician EMRs perfect, because it's a really, really big problem to deal with. But again, you link back to something, and everyone's very familiar with this. There's phrases that we use in the education online space, and you probably see it in the clinical research space as well, is that we, there's this phrase banded around called technology redundancy. And what we mean by that is that exactly what Bill has said there, you'll still have guys faxing on one end, someone using Android versus iOS. Someone We still encounter people using zip disks. You know, it's incredible, right? But if you have that technology redundancy, you end up with what's called a digital divide. You then end up with people who are completely different from the digital perspective, and therefore it's going to make things difficult in terms of data, in terms of clinical research, and then outreaching and involving patients. So one thing we have to think about is it's not necessarily the newest, best startup, newest, best technology. What you're leaning towards is also it's what we already have. Like, like we constantly say that physicians need to be communicating video by video, and people are always coming up with new solutions, but we've had video conferencing for years. You know, why does it have to be something new just to justify its position in Palo Alto? You know, it's, let's just think about it a bit more, right? You know, but having thought about that, I think it's good to see what you guys think. Like I think you've heard a little bit from everyone there, and it'd be great to, I'll pass this mic around, uh, and please pass it around amongst yourselves. Please ask any questions or make any comments or points, because I think it's important to hear what you guys also think about this, because it is, as all three of the panelists here have said, it's a, it's a big problem. You know, it's not something the three of us, well, three of you, and then me on the side can fix. But, the, you know, so let's think about this. So let me, who wants any comments, any questions at all? I saw Javid put his hand up initially there. So here, I'll pass the mic over. This is like, like you know, a talk show, like Ricky Lake. <laughs> like, you know, let's go. Like, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's a great discussion. Um, the main um, thing that popped up pretty quickly was about how data could be used to inform the right kind of research. Um, as a clinician, what we often see um, is that the research doesn't actually describe the patients we actually need to help necessarily very well. We're translating, making assumptions and approximations. Recently, in the last, I'd say, um, two to three years only, I've seen a couple better studies describing the sicker patients better. 
Um, otherwise, we extrapolate it from healthier patients to actually treat sicker patients. Um, and for statistical reasons, they've actually started niching down to those high-risk patients a bit more because you have to get more events so you can actually do better analysis with smaller numbers of patients. The downside is I can't extrapolate it upstream to patients then. I make assumptions again. So I think having that data become available to know actually this is what the problem that needs to be solved, not the assumptions we make that we look for simplicity. The trend tends to be go for the low-hanging fruit when you're designing studies or building products. They're not necessarily going to be the ones that actually sell the most or have the biggest demand in the marketplace. That's what we think we can produce for. Um, and I think it'll be very helpful to have that begin to inform where we draw our attention. So what we actually, what matters to the most number of people right now and that complexity factor. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think that determining the feasibility of a clinical trial needs to incorporate both data. Do these patient, patients actually exist? Can we find them? Can we enroll them into our studies? But then we also need to simulate the trials with all of the stakeholders. So one of the things that we do at Lilly is we have something called CoLab, and we bring in physicians, nurses, anybody else from the, um, the physician side who would be part of the clinical trial, as well as patients and their caregivers, and we simulate that trial. Does it work? Will it work for you to come in, you know, and, and do this? Does this piece of equipment even fit in an office? And so data can get us there, but then we need to test it out with real people. I, I just wanted to, to add to that too, is I think um, there's tremendous potential for us to have, you know, obviously we, we need to conduct trials in a certain way for, you know, the, the multitude of reasons that we do clinical trials. But I think with the ability for passive collection of a lot of medical information and aggregation of a lot of this uh, data that we've been talking about, we, we have the ability to create centralized databases to collect more information, take advantage of uh, the variability that's in um, people who would be participating in clinical trials, catalog it, put it into a centralized database, and then open that database to other researchers who have different questions perhaps in that population, so that the onus isn't necessarily on the developing drug company to find all the nuanced applications of the drug or to evaluate all of these interesting questions that surround it. We have the technology and we have the security and capability to create these disease registries, in a sense, um, that, that European countries have often already been investing in for many years and then open those up to the academic community to find, to, to do interesting research on it. Maybe they're going to do a whole bunch of, uh, you know, advanced machine learning on it to try and pick out subpopulations or different ways that people with this genetic background responded to this drug versus not. And they might find whole new applications for the medication that just weren't there before. Things that, that the drug company should not be, it should not be only on their shoulders to, to provide all of that. And I don't know, and I mean, I wonder from you, Caitlin, maybe, is like, I think if there was something like that where people could provide their data and in sort of like a, an, a forum like that securely, you know, to say, I'm going to contribute to this research, you know, even without being in the trial, essentially, so that my information can go into the database to be used for whatever. I mean, do you have a sense maybe of, of whether that's something that, that people would be interested in? Doing? Like I, I want to hear as a researcher. Yeah. Um, so I guess from the individual perspective, I don't think that I have data on myself to a certain degree, mm. um, because as after my diagnosis and hearing about different treatment options, there wasn't there wasn't a oh well let's follow along and say like you know if if this works or if it doesn't and and talk about the different, um, I guess, data that they can that they can pull from that. Mm -hmm. It was more just like, you can take this drug, or you can have this surgery, but it's going to come back. You're going to have it for the rest of your life. There's no cure, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I was like, wait, wait, wait. So I know that to a certain degree, this is a hormone-related condition. So is there a way that I can? look at my hormones and regulate them daily 
to know like, all right, well, maybe there's like a spike and like this is happening in my body and break it down so that I know and I can like from a global perspective be like, all right, this is what's normally happening in my body. This is the pattern. And like, can I change that on a day to day perspective and try to like make goals and like work towards that? And I've asked my doctor about that. And he's like, well, that doesn't exist. We don't have hormone testing. And I'm like, that's a lie. It's probably expensive. And that's why you're not giving it as an option. You can definitely quantify hormones. I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I would, I would love that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that right now I have any data really to give. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, the, the, you know, take my blood pressure and all of that when I go in and, but beyond that, I feel like there's not much about me that would be of use because they're not actively collecting data on me on a day-to-day -day basis. The, sorry. Oh, can I? So, so yesterday, Marianne Sterling talked about ways that we can contribute to big data. So you can go to brainhealthregistry.org and be a part of clinical research for Alzheimer's disease as a healthy individual. So I think that there are multiple ways that we can do it, but we just don't hear about it. So. As I said before, it comes down to communication. So obviously, it's not just about the data, because there, we could end up going down the dangerous path of just talking about data all the time. And hence, the word of the panel was innovation rather than data. Because I think it's important to realize that every perspective we're getting on the panel, and it's great, is that it only forms part of the whole process. So I want to hear more from you guys. We heard from Javid. Uh, and if no one puts a hand up, I'm going to do my Drew Carey and come running down to you. So here we go, we've got Varga up here. No, um, <clears throat> I was just wanting to uh, ask about like all the mobile platforms, whether it's research kit or alternatives like that, that allow kind of consumers to either input or have apps enable to write to that kind of data. And do you see that being kind of a, a solution to this or are there ways by which you can kind of crowdsource that information, even de-identified potentially for for research purposes? Um, so I think that those are part of the solution. I think those potentially provide a, a pathway for somebody like Caitlin, who was going to take it upon herself, for example, to track information that, that she thought might be helpful to um, give that to somebody who really wants to know about it. My I, whenever I talk about, you know, digital health and innovation within it, I always talk about we have this design problem with the way that we deal with it now. And I call it the human data bottleneck in that there's a, a lot. We have the technology to collect information in a, a thousand different ways. But the problem is, is that we're still manually collecting it and it's an active process. So there is no real uh, there's there's not the the passive collection of data that is clinically meaningful or research meaningful, let's say, uh, has not progressed as much as the ability for people to make apps for you to enter your blood pressure into and keep track of it. Um, and there's a huge barrier to, if you think about, you know, why you do something like that, you know, you as an individual have to be very activated in really saying, I'm committed to knowing this. So I'm going to spend five to 10 minutes every day entering this information into this app because I, that's the value that I derive from it. But that that's only going to ever work for the subset of the population who is, is activated in that sense. We can't expect everybody to get into this quantified self movement because not everybody will be interested in it. Um, and so the, the longer term solution, I think, is to advance the passive capabilities of collecting data without the need for us to manually enter it and without the need for people to actively make it part of their day. And, and that may be having open aggregated registries from EMRs. It may be, you know, having uh, the ability for you to just turn your smartphone sensors on and, and anonymously send the information. I, I don't know what that what that looks like. It, there are plenty of people in the wearable world that are working on cool solutions for, for that, like implantable sensors and things like that. Um, but, but I feel that until we can get to uh, that point where, where we don't actively have to be inputting, um, you know, that, that's the first barrier to, to get through. And, and that's why I think those HomeKit Research Kit um, 
apps are a good place to start, but I think we, we have some more work needs to be done. So just to add, I'm gonna throw a controversial question out and see what you guys think about this, but we're talking about being able to get that data freely that will help with clinical research and ultimately help the patients as well. But what do we think about patient safety data? You know, and what I mean by that is that some healthcare systems around the world are very, very good at monitoring their healthcare workers to make sure that they're safe, to make sure that they're up to date, to make sure that they're delivering good healthcare that will then be universal and therefore university uh, covering everyone. And one process in the UK that's very familiar is called revalidation. You know, doctors are audited every year, like to a point where that data is generated so you know who's safe in the country, who's not safe, warning lists come out, you know, and that's all digitized. And that helps also for, from a research perspective in terms of that we're able to identify key leaders who are safe, delivering good care, can help deliver clinical trials as well. And that's, that's a state-owned system. It creates a lot of paperwork for us, like you would not believe, but ultimately we're finding out our safety levels are getting better, which means we're also able to deliver better health. And so what do you guys think about that? What Bill, Caitlin, and Kelly are saying, I wanna hear more. So, I, and also what I wanna throw out there is that one of the key things about universal health coverage, and it's not, we haven't talked about it over three days, is access and delivery of healthcare for the non-communicable diseases, namely mental health, your respiratory disease, you know, um, things that aren't necessarily infectious. And because actually at the moment, in terms of health coverage, there is more focus on money, research, data, on diseases that are not, that are communicable, when it should be focusing on non-communicable. And mental health, for example, is gonna be, by 2030, the number one disease category that's gonna cause the biggest impact of quality of life. So I'm throwing these things out there because it creates more of a conversation, but it's relevant, of course. And, you know, and having heard what Caitlin was saying from her experience between here and Europe, I'm not saying either one is better or worse, just different, okay? <laughs> and so, It'd be good to hear what you guys think, because I think this is a big discussion, and let's go on from there. So who am I running to next? Okay. So I was just thinking, uh, based on what you were talking about there, I was thinking about how, I was thinking about exercise. So exercise, it's, it's great for our health, right? Your doctor probably doesn't exercise with you, uh, generally. You know, maybe he does some push-ups with you there in, in the surgery, but uh, you go and you work with somebody. Yeah, yeah, see, that doesn't happen, right? I, but want, we know. This, I want this yeah. new age Californian doctor that yeah. you speak of. <laughs> Do, doing yoga while they ask you questions and diagnose you. And, and, and so that's really important because they actually send you to go and work with somebody who specializes in exercise. So we have there, uh, in some ways, a health intervention that we could say is part of universal health coverage, but it happens outside of the healthcare system. When you're exercising, you get hurt a lot. Uh, and so I was thinking when you were talking about patient safety there, Canal, the, um, we might see the exercising, we might look at the data. And say, actually, so many people are getting hurt when they exercise, they should not exercise. And this, when running as a, as a hobby first came out, there were doctors published papers saying, no, you should not run, you will have a heart attack. And the guy who um, initially was popularizing this, he actually died of a heart attack after a run. But we still run. We, we run all the time. And, and so one of the things that I was thinking about as we were talking about this, can the healthcare system provide universal healthcare coverage or is it going to be a barrier to it? Is it like, do we have to start looking outside of it if we want to get something that's quite universal? Anyone on the panel in the audience want to add to that? Or respond rather, who first? Yeah, you've had your words already. <laughs> going to shift the conversation a little. So if there's anybody that wants to. But health care, but health. And health is more than just the healthcare system or the industry that we've built around it. It actually is more pervasive. Um, that's why in the UK, you now have grocery stores being involved in blood pressure tracking for patients. It's an issue that we started in the last couple of weeks that was published around. So I think what we should recognize, it's, it's about making sure that what we do in the intervention is less than 1% of patients' life and where you actually have impact, it's about broadening it. But the question around this data was, um, where do you actually bring in safety? We've, we've already proven that you can actually de-anonymize data very quickly with just a couple of pieces of ancillary information about patients. So 
unless it's aggregated, you really don't have any, like there was one study with three pieces of data you could actually track back to the individual patient. Not even six, which was the initial study you found a couple of years ago. Which means for privacy for a patient, you almost can't afford to share at a certain level if there's an issue, unless there's tight governance that prevents insurance companies from being able to actually do the process and use the data. Um, which essentially would be a governance that allows fraud at some point, right? Because patients may not disclose something, and this would allow them to bypass that process then. Um, so how do we reconcile this need? And when you look at aggregate data, that's great at a population level, but it's not meaningful for rare diseases. It's not meaningful for truly individualization or personalization or precisioning um, of, of uh, the decisions we make. So how do we, where do we sit on, on that aspect of it? Um, so I think that we have to, to get back to your question, use data in the right ways while also protecting patient safety and, um, and patient anonymy and patient privacy. Sorry, I just hijacked the mic. Um, <laughs> we're not quite done yeah, yet, we're not sorry. Too, Kyle, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I was just thinking back to your, your very first comment that we're talking about health and that it's very, very dangerous when we don't talk about health and we don't talk about what's normal. Because when I was growing up, I thought I was normal. I thought there was nothing wrong with me. And I just kept pushing myself and pushing myself. And at 22, when I was finally diagnosed, I was exhausted, I was done, I was a zombie. And from 14 until 22, I danced six days a week. I rode on the equestrian team. I ran a marathon, I biked, you know, a a 40 day bike trip through all the south of France. And I just kept going and I just kept on bringing on these challenges because I saw other people doing them and I was like, I wanna do that. And I ignored the pain and I just kept pushing because as a dancer, you just kind of learn like there's good pain and bad pain. And I didn't realize, I guess, what the good pain and the bad pain was and just kept pushing myself and pushing myself. And I was so exhausted my last two years of college and I didn't understand why. And I didn't understand why I was starting to, um, like during, uh, when I was horseback riding, I used to fall a lot at the end of my um, university um, career uh, because I, I was just exhausted. And so I have wonderful videos, if you wanna see, of me face planning, it's great. Um, but I, I just want to, you know, drive home that it can be very dangerous when we don't talk about what our health baseline is and what is healthy and what is, should be considered normal and what we should be striving for. So. And that's okay. Go ahead. I, I just want to put the, I just, I just want to put the, uh, the point to what you're saying about data security and privacy. I think uh, there's no answer. I don't have an answer to that. I think the underlying subtext of that question is where does liability rest? Um, you know, I think there's a fear about moving this information around because the, the burden of responsibility if that information gets lost in transition is not well defined. Um, and I think that subcon that that undertone really colors a lot of people's uh, opinions about this thing and, and perhaps limits us to think broadly, more broadly about what we could do um, in that sort of innovative kind of ideas. Um, and so I think there has to be an effort towards putting in a, a good sort of legal framework for who is responsible, what happens with this, you know, protecting each level, protecting the technologists and innovators protecting the, the patients in particular, as you said, and protecting physicians from, from something that might not be, you know, in their control. So just to finish that thought. So as we promised this woman at the front here, she did have a question, uh, so please go. So we've been talking a lot about collecting more data and how to treat unique populations, but when I look at that slide up there, we're talking about massive numbers of people in countries around the world who, where we have the data and we know what is wrong. We have a lot of information. So I'm curious to have us talk a little bit about how innovation and some of these new methodologies and where we're putting resources to treat the known 
problems that affect massive amounts of people. I mean, you know, if it's as simple as clean water in a country, and we haven't figured that out yet. So I suppose if I had a rare disease, I would have a different perspective. I don't. So I would like to see us figure out how to deliver healthcare using innovation and communication technologies where we already know what is needed. So I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that um, because certainly it's important to continue to learn and address those folks that have unique situations, but we're not taking care of the masses yet either. I guess I'll start. Um, I totally agree. Um, there was a great presentation yesterday and the, the name eludes me, but um, we talked about we have technologies for many things already and we should really focus on repurposing them for in a healthcare sense. Um, and how much potential there is in that. I think it goes back to um, you know some of the points we discussed earlier in that it's a lot sexier in the innovation world to say, let's collect this cool information and do something really funky with it and you know people and be the first and we'll make a bunch of money. Um, the, the problem is that big problems are expensive and not particularly lucrative. So, Finding a solution to clean water for 100 million people in, you know, uh, rural India is, you know, a great cause for public health and society, globalized society. But the, uh, the financial incentive is not as strong as coming up with a proprietary juicer in Southern California that you can charge $400 a month for. Right, there's very little ROI. Right. Um, I, I wish I had an answer. Um, I could add something there. We've just got to wrap up shortly there, but very quickly, from an international development perspective, the buy-in is convincing governments and ministries that actually long-term, by investing in data management, services provision, clinical research, your long-term costs of health provision down the line drop dramatically. But obviously, the initial cost is the big spend. But we have to wrap it up a little bit, so I was just going to ask after Bill, uh, Caitlin, Kelly, do you have any final points to add to this, I mean, very difficult, long, complicated conversation, but one that's important. Anything else to add? First, can we we'll go down sure. the line? Right. Go down, yeah, okay. go for it. So I guess my takeaway is that data is really cool, but communication is even cooler. I like that. because. With communication comes education, and I think that's critical for, for everyone's health to understand what's normal and what when they need to go and seek help. I, I would, you guys have said it, I don't need to repeat it, but yes, I, I agree, and I think we, we have tremendous opportunity to think about, if we think about the context of universal health coverage in the sense of we want to provide health care to everybody, then it at least puts us all on the same playing field to say, if I'm going to, if I want to answer this interesting question or if I want to start that company to do this or do that, if you have that as a guiding principle, then maybe either that puts pressure upstream on governments and some of these larger problems get solved. I think it, it has to be sort of a, a collective kind of goal that people hold in mind when they think about, when they think about healthcare is think about I'm improving it, but how can I improve it, it for everybody? And part of that is communication and data, but uh, a lot of it is just collaboration. Okay, and my final point is obviously being biased is um, ultimately it doesn't matter you know, if you don't have enough health care, well, health care workers to provide the health care. So number one, think about that. But ultimately, we always said in our office as the solution to all of this is never look at a patient, a person, a community or a society as a block of data ones and zeros, or as a dollar sign. If you go down that road, this will never be achievable. And that's something to think about, okay? But to really wrap it up, I'm gonna ask you to stick your hands up really high. Do you now know what the meaning of universal health coverage is? If you do, your hands go up. Okay, all right, that's fine. No, it's, it's a difficult one to, to define um, because you get confusing input on it. And then number two, do you, 
put your hands up if you think innovation will help support it. Hi, I'm seeing hands that are low. Really, <laughs> we're getting people who don't think innovation will help. That's fine. And then put your hand up if you don't think it's achievable. Universal health coverage. Interesting, you see, so the, the conversation has to continue um, and we'll take it from there. So thank you very much, right?